Hey everybody, this is Uncle Matt's D and D neighborhood, and today we have uh, with us Jim Wampler. Say hi, Jim. Howdy. All right. As always, I have forgotten to turn off or rather mute the channel, so I need to do that <laughs> real quick, and then uh, then I can get back to the actual show itself. So here we are. Um, the real the real quick intro here. Um, and uh, I look like I may have frozen here, but uh, my guest so, tonight is some goon. He does some stuff, and he's here to gab the gab. That's right. So, so Jim's <laughs> going to jump in there. No, I was going to. I was just going to say, um, everybody who's watching, uh, mostly it is the usual suspects and uh, the the folks that are already saying hello to each other in the chat room. Um, but for those who are watching later, I uh, just wanted to ask you to please subscribe to the channel uh, if you like the show, and also uh, to like the video or if you. Um, have uh, uh, criticism about the video, please don't necessarily dislike the video. Put it in the comments so that I actually know what the criticism is because I've gotten, uh, I have uh, Zach Glazer's wife, Jen, uh, generally comes in when she thinks I need a haircut and I've been told not to spin around in my chair because it looks juvenile. So uh, stuff like that is helpful. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, I know. Uh, we're here with Jim to talk about his top five DM tips. Jim is uh, the author of Mutant Crawl Classics. Uh, he is the uh, the artist of Marvin the Mage, which you may be familiar with, and uh, lots and lots of other um, RPG industry stuff. And so an excellent person to pull in here and get one perspective on um, what it looks like from behind the DM screen when you're running it. Um, what are the tips for making that go smoothly? And so we're going to run through, and I asked you to get five, and I don't know what they are. Um, so do you want to begin with the one that you think is the least important or the one that you think is the most important or how do you want to, uh, do, do these tips? I'll just do them in the order I wrote them. Okay. That sounds good. But, uh, so, uh, I, I, cause I put some thought into it. Um, so these are not just like, you know, the obvious things like, uh, remember you're killing the characters, not the players. You know, Which everybody always, knows that one. I always have to keep that in mind. But, um, um, and and many of these are things that I've just learned in the last few years. So, um, I, you know, this is this is some years in behind the screen. Uh, my first uh, DM tip uh, that I'm super religious with, and I and I've watched you do it too, is always say yes to your players. And uh, it's even better if you can say yes and. And that's a tip I picked up from uh, watching uh, improv comedy groups because that's the rule in improv whatever the other person throws you whatever situation or line they say you respond with yes and and build on it because i mean after all what what's D D or any other role-playing game it's it's improv live improv right at the table you don't have any idea what your players are going to do what <laughs> where they're going to turn left or right and they don't have they don't know what you have in store for them right and so that um and that, yeah, so that sort of collectively builds the picture. But if you keep saying no, 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 um, you know, then then you're sort of keeping things so tightly, you know, within. Well, there's gold in those hills because, I mean, it's, 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 it's not just being affirmative as opposed to negative. It's the unexpected results that will, will build up out of nowhere. It's things that you couldn't have uh, foreseen or planned for. They're often super exciting. My favorite thing on earth is when I think I've got a killer boss fight or a killer dungeon entrance going and there's no way in or no way around except, you know, my author way. And I'm at a con and a bunch of super smart, super inventive players just do something I didn't think of and, wa you, and, and walk right in. And I, I freaking love that, man. You know, there, um, Gosh, I wish I could remember who I was talking to, but uh, there was somebody else. We were talking about designing adventures and discovered that both of us have no problem with the idea of putting in um, some sort of puzzle or issue that as the DM, when you're first writing the adventure, that you don't actually know how it can be solved. And, and you know, to you, it seems impossible. And then wait to see because, um, you know, when you've got, you know, four or five minds working together, they're going to come up with something and it's going to surprise you. Yeah, you're getting close to something else that's further down my list. But yeah, I mean, okay. um, a, a, this is why we play test. You know, everything's a great idea when it's in my head, right? Yeah. Did you play test at, at a convention or at your uh, friendly local game store and suddenly you see the gaping gap in what you created? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, uh, right. and, and half the time at a con, it'll be like some, you know, youngster 
because they're not as inured to all the the uh, conventions of the genre as we are, and they're just thinking free outside the box, and they come up with some solution you hadn't even considered. Which oh yeah, is super awesome. Yeah, no, playing playing with young players is is a lot of fun. Um, it really resets you, you know, back to uh, some of the really outside the box stuff. I mean, outside the box, the box we constructed the box over years of play. Um, you know, and, and every, each one of us has our box. That's the creativity zone that we just were so established in certain routines that we, um, that we all have that. And the, the older, I think you are as a DM or a player, um, you know, the more hardened and patented that box starts to become. And then you get, you know, a, a younger player and you're like, wow, that's creative. Well, as you know, uh, uh, I'm good personal friends with Tim Kask and I'm, I'm not name dropping. It's just, you know, we live down the street from each other and Tim Cask is the uh, is the editor of original Dungeons and Dragons and so is one of the super you know celebrity uh, folks out there for anyone who doesn't know who Jim's talking we're just about. like you know call each other on the cell phone wherever you you feel like it and it's inevitably when the other guy's in the bathroom friends okay and uh, so you know I've watched I, I've, I've played with Tim, Tim DMing obviously a lot I've watched Tim DM so it it's it's uh, completely expected that some of my tips and tricks and things I've picked up. It just uh, It's not just Tim. It's Mike Curtis, Brendan LaSalle, you, Bill, a bunch of people who are DMs with skill sets I uh, admire that I will watch and study and, and you know, and try and steal steal some of your tricks, right? That's yeah, absolutely. Basic, you know, hey, I like the way Brendan LaSalle runs things like it's a freaking parade circus but never seems to lose control of the game. Well, okay, I'm having that. I'm going to try that too. <laughs> I won't do it as good as Brendan, but I'm having it. But my point was going to be, it's one thing and expected for me to have studied Tim, but uh, we, you know, he's watched me. I just caught him recently. You know, he'll pop up with, you know, you do this one thing in your game. I was watching you at Game Ocon. I think I'm going to start doing that. You know, so we're all in this together. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, every you you always you know improve skills, or there'd be no point to this video, frankly. I mean, the, this video, the, I think the people who are going to watch this, I mean, there might be a couple of brand new uh, DMs watching it, but I, I suspect you know that uh, you know it's going to be experienced DMs who are like, okay, how do I up my game uh, on something like this? And um, just because it's you know t it's talking about tips instead of how to start, um, and that's you know that's how you that's how you get better is watching games, listening to people talk so on and so forth but let's move on let's move on to point number two and then that'll give us some time toward the end where we can sort of m mash them all up and talk about how to uh, how to put them into play so what's your what is your tip number two sorry i'm a long talker um me too tip, tip number two is something i did literally do one way for 30 years and just in the past five or six have started doing another way and that is roll my dice out in front of the screen in front of god and everybody mm -hmm. Um, I was, I just, the way I was brought up DMing, it was all secret behind the screen. I did that for decades. And, uh, uh, a guy I really like named Adam Miskevich came down from Michigan. He's in that Yukon group of players and ran some games for us. And he just did that. And I immediately saw the difference it made in the, uh, tension and drama level of the yep. game, because there's no doubt that a die roll is being fudged. And when the monster does hit you and the damage right there in front of you, it's just like what happens when the players are in combat, when it's time for you to roll for the monster, the whole table leans in to see what happens. And yep. I like that. At some point I may pull Skeeter in, um, with you for um or, or various people who have their disagreements with the points that we're making here because it would be interesting um to see some of the discussion because there are also some strong arguments uh, you know for keeping some stuff uh, somewhere all behind the, the sure screen. but well, let's parse it out i mean you know if it's a, a secret check that the player doesn't literally know whether he succeeded or not like a thief check sure behind the screen and uh uh I'm of the strong belief and will argue anyone till the end of time that everybody has fudged die rolls. Every DM has fudged a die roll at some point or another. And and that's one of the pushbacks when I've talked about this before is, well, now what, what if I, you know, what if I roll a crit at exactly the worst possible moment and it's going to wipe the whole table and I'm rolling out in front, I can't fudge it. Well, just remember you're the DM. You can put any modifiers on that roll you want and keep them all in your head. Right? Here's my thing on that. I think, and, this is something I've written about and that I'm um, in, in one of the projects I'm working on um, that I'm writing about uh, is that that actually goes to a much deeper level, that issue. I mean, yes, it does affect the tension and pacing. No question. It ups the excitement. 
But there's more to it than that, because what you're doing when you roll out front of a DM screen is that you are maintaining one of the things that to most players, I think, is the most important thing about a role-playing game, which is that if they're going to win and succeed, it's got to be fair or else it's a hollow victory. And by rolling the dice out front, and so, you know, if they suspect that you may have fudged something, um, that that actually can take away from some of the reward that they get oh, from it. This is why we're friends and we get along so well, because it's, I mean, we could do a whole separate show on the idea of risk versus reward mm -hmm. and dramatic tension. Yes. And, and the various play styles that engender different levels of that. But I agree 100% with what you just said. And, and in our, and, and recently in one of the games where you were one of my players, um, you did something dumb as shit um <laughs> I'll cop to it. it's, a, it's a fair cop uh, which was riding out with a magic user while you were playing OD D um to to get within spell range um of some enemies and, and they had some forward uh guards out there but the uh the thing was that you got hit by a hold person spell uh and i nerfed later on the effect of that and the reason i nerfed it um and so, you know, because I will occasionally nerf something, but the reason that I do it usually is to fix a decision that I made that was a wrong decision early on. It's not necessarily to keep people alive for the sake of not having somebody be sad about a character. And so in that case, it was because I had m mistakenly put two of my forward scouts, spellcasters, into the area where you came out and did it reflexively. I was just, I know I've got two forward scouts. Here they are. They're both casting spells at you when actually it was supposed to be one forward scout in this group and one in that group. So that, and then, you know, there's no way of, you know, going back and saying, okay, let's replay it. So and what I did was- how were you to know I was going to roll a one on my save only because I do it every time. Right, that that <laughs> too. Um, no, you roll sixes too. Ones and sixes are, are your thing. So, uh, but anyway, so, but yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a really- um, important psychological part of the game is that the players do not perceive you um, as having fudged or nerfed anything. Um, now, whether they'd rather have a character die or not is, n is not clear from that because it, it sucks to have a character die. But, uh, but you know, when they're winning, they certainly don't want to feel like things were nerfed. So rolling the dice out front, in addition to working on the tension and pacing, I think that's a really good point. And, and for, a sec for that second reason as well, that they want to know that they took on the world fair and square and won. Yeah, you touched on another big thing, too, that doesn't really, I mean, it only ties into my list of top five tips in that they all engender this, but uh, player DM trust is crucial to a good game and especially crucial to an ongoing campaign. Yeah, I mean, I and it's, and 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 if you don't take that responsibility as a DM, it's an easy trust to break, and you once you break it, you can't get it back. Yeah, which was actually why I went back to you and explained why I nerfed something and how I how I decided to do it. Um, anyway, let's move on to tip number three. What's tip number three? Tip number three is listen to your players when they speculate. So much oh, of yes. DMing is presenting your own material to the players, and then they're discussing amongst themselves. And if they're old school players, they'll tell you, I, I want to try and do this. If they're the newer generation, they'll ask you if they can, which I try and say you can try anything you want you know the because i run old school describe it to me it's your job to talk it into me and if we can get it down to dice roll that's what we'll do but uh the yeah the, the, the trick we've already talked about before you know what what happens when you've got a partially mapped dungeon the players like they are uh you know police hound dogs will sniff out the one part of the dungeon you haven't mapped yet and make a beeline for it so now, now they're going into an area of the dungeon you haven't mapped yet. What do you do? And my favorite trick is just to slap down an obstacle or a door that won't open just long enough to get them frustrated a little bit. Because the player psychology will tend to be, at least in my circles, oh, there's something really good in there he doesn't want us to get, he or she. Right. Or you know, and, and, and that once, 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 I mean, the easy thing would be that you can't get past that door you know, go to the next door. Players won't do that. They'll, so they'll spend an every enormous amount of effort and marshal everything at their uh, command to try and get through that door. And they will, by God, figure out a way to get their triceratops through the swamp and to the dungeon. Door. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I watched that. That was awesome. Um, right, right, right. And so, uh, and, and what did you do? You said yes and. But uh, all you got to do is just 
frustrate them and stop them for a little while and listen to what they say and pay attention to it because they will inevitably start speculating about what's the solution to the uh, getting past the door or what's in the room and you can and you're screwed otherwise because you've got nothing for them to go into the room and find and just pick the best idea you hear and then let them in a room and when they get in there they they've unknowingly taken on an extra part of the story building burden from you um, they've they've been you know ideating wildly, so it's you, you get a lot of great ideas to to choose from, and then the player even, who whose guess you took even gets to go in the room and go, I knew that's what was in here. Well, okay, but that's a great theatrical issue, and of course it is great when the guy's like, you know, yes, I I nailed it, but doesn't that in a way violate exactly the issue about DM trust that you were talking about, because you've used their speculation against them well only if I, well since your intention is just to supply them with you know a room to go into that they desperately want to go into i don't see how that violates the trust <laughs> that's another that's another whole question and i mean maybe this should have been about. secret you know secret dm tricks that players aren't allowed to listen to that's right you have to have the secret dm subscription where somebody you know signs an affidavit that you're actually a dm um I mean, the, it's like uh, poker faces. You've got a great poker face. I have none at all. I watch you DM all the time trying to figure out your little tells on your face, and you just don't have them. I know I have no poker face, so I will uh, use that back to my advantage and just role play emotions in the middle of a game to try and get the players to nudge that way or nudge this way yeah. or just See, increase the drama. Because so, so I actually do – at least most of the time, and I'm thinking off the cuff here, but I think m most of the time I actually do the opposite of what you do there with that tip. I actually try and um, screen out, not listen to what it is that they're speculating and focus on rapidly coming up with what's going to be on the other side of that game. And you buy yourself a lot of time while they're speculating. Um uh, but I tend to think of it in terms of um, let's see how it works. You know, once again, and 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 that's there's that's there's a definite DMing philosophy behind that, and and I think that we're actually articulating two different DM philosophies, neither one of which is right. But yours is the more um, participatory um, community group, whereas mine is going as far as I can to provide uh, the players with a world that is legit, objectively what they run into. And so that's kind of that's interesting. I, yeah, I don't disagree. My single favorite word in the entire English language that I can't pronounce is verisimilitude. Yeah, and that's what you're talking about. It, yep. you know, is it is it obviously true unto itself? Does it make logical sense? And there, and you know, I obviously do my version of that. But there's nothing. I mean, these are just my tips. There's no right or wrong. You know. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, oh yeah. No, no, no. I'm not right arguing. I'm not arguing people. with your tip. I mean, it's 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 valid. It's just that on all of these, there are probably um, alternative schools of thought on things, and it's just it's interesting. You know that on this one. Um, because I agree with your first two entirely. You know, those are things that I follow. And on this one, it's interesting that we've got a different uh, approach to it. Because mine, I don't think is, I don't actually think is about verisimilitude. It's about just the idea of, you know, how far do you go? Granted that it is not at all possible to do this perfectly, but going as far as you can go um, to have a world in which they are encountering, um, a world that either you made without reference to to what they're doing, or that is generated according to um, objectively fair tables. So, I I, I think we actually agree because um, I mean, what, what what we're talking around is um, how stretchy and gonzo is your world. OK, yes. and there there are limits to that. And uh, I didn't even mean to bring up Gonzo because it's an unfortunate adjective that different, <laughs> means different things to different people. But you have a whole lecture prepped on Gonzo, I know. But that's why I went to verisimilitude is because it's just, uh, you know, are there consequences to actions? And if you disconnect or unbuckle those. You could, you know, that you can be stretchy in a fantasy role playing game where you can point your finger and shoot a lightning bolt. You can be pretty stretchy with the rules, but you don't want it to get silly. And if it's consequence free, then there's no risk, and then there's no reward. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the it's an interesting point. Simply the fact that, that sounds to me what you're trying to articulate. And I agree. I mean, I, th I think you, I think you did just articulate, you know, what I was trying to say. It's, uh, um, it's a, it's a very interesting topic, and there's, you know, easily a whole video on on the issue of the fact that um, what the players want you to do um, is to is to model a real fantasy world for them. And that it's okay for a DM to understand that that is impossible to do with an entire world. You have to have shortcuts. Some of those are objective, like tables, uh, and some of them are not, um, be simply based on the reality of the situation. I mean, if you if you know that you know your creative juices are not flowing right at that moment, then you cannot do what I was talking about behind your delaying door i'm gonna have to listen to the speculation for some sort of inspiration because i know that i don't have it myself to do mine and that there are all kinds of um these little windows into that fantasy world but there can never be anything more than windows you know and none of them are going to be perfect or doctrinaire or anything like that you know it's a uh, that's why dming is an art rather than a science yeah i mean you know it's whatever works for you and and gets gets an idea going because you know what my average table it's eight on one i can't outthink eight people all at once i'm not that fast yep and eric swanson has raised um he's said something something quantum ogres um so i'm going to demonstrate just how skilled i am at knowing uh the various blogs and things that's a term that comes from courtney gamble Aha. Oh, and, this is uh, this is news to me, so I'm excited to learn it. Okay. Well, it is um uh it it it, it is once again um sort of backing up my issue about having the objectively real fantasy world so that the players know that they are uh, encountering a real world. And the point um that Courtney Campbell made, and I, I I really do encourage anyone to take a look at his blog, and it's called Hack and Slash. And I can't remember whether that's the full name of the blog or not. Um, but you probably can search it with hack slash, you know, Courtney Campbell. And the um, point that Courtney makes, or he is, is asking the question of, is it fair to simply have one ogre and to have a path that forks in two directions and whichever way they go, they encounter your ogre? And hence, it's the quantum, uh, the quantum ogre. Superpositioned which, ogre. Right. In which case, you have taken what appears to be a meaningful decision and rendered it non-meaningful. And I don't want us to go deeply into that because that is an even deeper rabbit hole than the stuff you and I have been talking about. But it's a fascinating question. Well, you sure let me respond just a little DM bit. Though, yeah, right? go ahead. Yeah. Um, I mean, because I think that's super interesting. And uh, it's uh, it, it's connected to everything else we've talked about and or, or would talk about in that um, that's a GM tool to decide to rig an adventure that way. And all of these things, you know, all the powers of the game master are to be used, you know, with good intention, consciously and responsibly. Because if you want to railroad your players into that ogre there's you know you don't have to make him quantum you could just make sure yeah never mind you could do the same thing well here's i mean here's one of the um the possible countervailing points about the quantum ogre is what if i had using objective tables said to myself they're going to run into five encounters during the course of the adventure um number one is a dragon number two I've rolled up an ogre using completely objective tables. Now, what if the forking road is simply flavor and fluff? But I have objectively determined, according to the fantasy world, that these are the things. And so that, you know, and in that case, I think you've got an argument that it is actually not a railroad because you rolled those results. Um, so anyway, you know, so we, and well, again, like I said, it's a deep, that one is a deep rabbit hole. There were like three long blog posts on that. Whatever's the most fun, man. I, 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 I do uh, play a little loose, uh, even when it's, you know, my campaign and my group and we're going to see each other again, you know, not just a one off at a con game. I, 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 I like, I like the uh, boundaries a little loose, but uh, you know, it's just like dice fudging. 
anybody that says they have never fudged a dice roll is a dirty damn liar. And I've done this too. I've <laughs> like, you know, and, and, and often in the player's benefit where I've, you know, miswritten something where there's a MacGuffin they have to have their whole point point and purpose is to find that MacGuffin. And they didn't even go in that room. They just walked right by it or didn't pick up on a clue. And so the MacGuffin moved down the quantum right. ogre path. Right. Now, Skeeter, I think he was answering to my thing about what if I honestly rolled those encounters and my forks in the road were just uh, were just part of the flavor description of the journey. Skeeter's saying that that's a script as opposed to a railroad. So that's an interesting distinction. Um, and I would I would still disagree with it because of the objective method of determining it. But uh, um, I, I and, promise we'll get back to the list. But just yeah, one and, more thing. I mean, Glenn, Glenn, I love Glenn's question because it's like a tree falling in the forest. He says, if the players don't realize it's a railroad, is it actually a railroad? Right. So right. I, we'll drop that one, Glenn. But <laughs> if an end falls in the forest, then there's nobody to get XP. Yeah. If an end falls in the forest, does Isengard remain standing? <laughs> But uh, inevitably, in discussions like this, you 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 will bump up against or run right through playstyle preference. You know, you, we yeah. can we can we can uh, very logically and civilly debate game mechanics, but you can't debate playstyle preference. People like what they like. You could well, well, that's yeah. No, okay, I was going to debate it, but I think. <laughs> <laughs> i love you man all right so let's get on to uh tip number four what's what's your tip number four? Oh, uh tip number four is what to do when things go wrong um i like running high risk high reward old school style games so what's the number one thing that is inevitability it's like a, a meme i saw on facebook you know merry christmas happy hanukkah merry quasda space your death is still inevitable <laughs> <laughs> your players die character will die and uh so my my rule about that is you know when when the unlucky player you know character dies it must be as spectacular as possible and the reason for that is because having studied uh all this role-playing nonsense from a psychology point of view I've put a lot of thought into what are we at, why are we playing and what do we actually win? And my uh, thesis on that has always been that the coin won in a role playing game is the story you tell about it later. You know, when the epic boss fight happens or you were dead certain your party was going to TPK and you somehow squeaked it through against magnificent odds, um, and you're telling that story three years later, you know, in the dealer room at Gary Con, that's what we win. So, by that. And, that and that would make it the DM's job that that's your that's your coin is to deliver something that's worth a story if they do something that is worth a story or in the case of, of dying is simply one of those things that is de facto it's decided it's a thing it's a rule that that's one of the things where you have to make it a good story well I mean okay th things just didn't go your way and your character died in a game you know what's more fun uh I got critted by a goblin crossbow or I picked up the wrong ring and the antebellum of the shrine at the volcano and the mountain went up and the, you know, there was a cavern and everybody got out. But me Yeah. now, now the DM told me my, my body fell into the lava pits, been fossilized and archeologists in the future will dig it up. Okay. And I believe, I believe That's a story. Of, <laughs> I believe one of Tim Cask's characters um, ended up on a conveyor belt and was uh, encased in Lucite in one of Gary Gygax's uh, early games. I had Bill Webb like forty years ago, and he's still telling the story. Yeah, yeah, and I, I you know, one of Bill Webb, uh, uh, not one of Bill, uh, Bill Webb's son uh, uh, in mine um, made the terrible decision of trying to stealth along a wall. Uh, in a room where there were iron golems who simply don't care whether you're a thief and hiding in shadows. And so first he died uh, being hit by uh, one of the iron golems and then fell into the pool of acid that he was going around. And so it didn't, you know, first he died, then he dissolved. So, you know, that's, it's stories. I, I agree with you on that. Oh, I, I, I want to tell a quick story. I'll make it as okay. quick as I can. 
uh, years ago, we talked to him into running a campaign, and, and he did for about two years. And I had so much fun, I invited my brother to join a group. Tim let him in. Uh, God bless my brother. He had only DM'd for like two decades. So he can't wait to play. And with never playing with Tim before and no forewarning, he just lands at the table with a halfling thief. We get to the first room of the dungeon. There's an idol with a gem, and he's like, I run right up that idol and grab the gem. <laughs> yeah. And and it was, you know, and then he took 10d6 of electricity and set the record for quickest character death in, <laughs> in Tim's game. Five years later, I talked Tim into, uh, at this last Gary Con into participating in our uh, at a celebrity DCC game I'm running, and he's got a dwarf. And I wasn't even running something I wrote. I was running uh, Joe Bittman's The One Who Watches Below. And son of a bitch, if there's not a room with gems above an archway and Tim runs his dwarf straight up to grab <laughs> one without thinking and gets polymorphed into a 20 eyed spider. Yep. We've got, uh, let me mention one or two of the things um, from the, the, the chat room again. Um, we have one um, interesting um, nuance brought up by James Stanton, which is that there, there may be some uh, difference in the way the game is played in level one and two, and then post third level that since the level one and level two characters go down so easy that that's one of the things that's emphasized at the lower level of the game and since they go down easy it's less important to make the death epic than it would be third and beyond i don't think i agree well, sure. with, i mean with, uh, with jim on that but it's a, it's an interesting distinction of pointing out the fact that to some degree it's a different game at, at lower level middle level and higher level and I that's mean, I true. Can, that's been true. All, I can see all what he means because in Dungeon Crawl Classics and Mutant Crawl Classics, you start out at zero with four or five of those level zero guys, and you know the expectation is they're going to go down like you know bales of wheat. Yeah, but it's you know, but the the idea that the, that the theatrics and the coin, as, as you said, of of the dungeon master may be different in those phases of the game is a really interesting. Uh, point there so um, bring it I love having a chat room especially when it's a, a bunch of people that uh, you know it's generally the the usual suspects so uh, uh, if you are one of the 20 people watching live and we've definitely got 20 people less than fewer than 20 people in the chat room you feel free to jump on the chat room it's not like some exclusive uh, thing there you know we're we're happy to answer uh, and, and hopeful to answer questions from people who aren't usually watching the show but um, anyway, tip number five. What's tip number five? I kind of forget myself. Let me check my list. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, again, something that I just be I just began consciously practicing within like the last five six years is um, every DM has aspirations for how, how they want players to play, right? Like one of the one of the deals with running con games is you just you know people sign up publicly and you get who you get and then there's your, even your own home group where you know you'll have players of different playstyle preferences and different levels and abilities and what have you and uh, my big thing is whatever it is I want out of my players I need to do that myself so if I want to encourage emergent role playing then I need to role play the holy crap out of my NPCs. If I if I want them to uh, think and not just react to everything, then it falls on me to uh, have my NPC characters think and not just react. Um, do I want them to uh, listen to each other more? Well, then I need to one by one make sure I'm listening to each of them. It's just sort of a lead by example thing, but it works especially with the role playing. It works really good. Yeah. Uh, role playing is not. Uh, act, I mean, like the. I tend to go third person. So the first person role playing is not my specialty personally. Um, but I've had to try and get better at that because if that's what I want out of the players, then I need to give my NPC some gusto, you right. know? So, so I'm never going to do voices as good as Michael Curtis. I can still do voices, <laughs> still give it a go. <laughs> We've got, uh, we, we did in, in response to that thing, we had several of people, uh, pop up with the, on the chat room. So, Hey Rocky, I'm glad you're watching. Uh, Tom Tullis is watching. Um, all of the Chulix are watching. So I throw out a, a, a special one to, uh, uh, to Peter being in a different city or, or Pete, I forget how you, how, how you guys do it, but the, uh, uh, being out in a different city currently without a game. So I'm, I'm glad that you're watching me and I hope that this helps fill that in until you get a group going. Um, 
Oh, Michael Bolum, my good and fine friend. Yeah, yeah. Well, but you know what? If something's hard for you, there's only one way to get better at it. Do yeah. it. Do it repeatedly yeah. and practice it. I'm I'm reading this uh, really good book that everybody should read. It has frack all to do with D&D and role playing. It's a book called Play by Dr. Stuart Brown, and it's a psychology book on uh, what what play does to our brain. So it's related to this. And Stuart Brown was the name? Stuart Brown. Um, I'll, I'll put a link to that. Um, the main title is play. And then there's a long ass subtitle. I can't remember, but the, like one of the thesis of the book is these psychologists have done this research and learned, well, how do we, how do we learn things? Well, one way is through repetition, rote memorization. So they charted that you, it can take up to 400 repetitions for you to learn something for you to form a synapt, a physical synaptic pathway in your brain. But the same thing can be learned in as few as 10 to 12 repetitions. If it's through the act of play. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reason I brought that up suddenly is we're talking about the difficulty some of us have with first person play is um, I, I, which is happening in the chat room, by the way. So and if, if this is done as a as a live rolling video, you should be able to see uh, what people are posting up uh, in the chat room. And so Michael Bolum has said first person is is really hard. Um, that's 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 where the 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 slight topic shift is going uh, over to first person is because of the chat. room. So. Well, I bring this up because I just want I'm I'm gonna like completely rat myself out as a as a human being in that <laughs> t- my starting well because what what happens to me at my age is is I will run into younger players and younger DMs and younger aspiring writers uh, who are starting from some of the same places I started with and everything's hard and I just remind people none of us came out of the shoot knowing how to do any of this and in fact as recently as uh, 10 or 15 years ago, um, I couldn't run a con game. I, I And I just refused to. Uh, I have, uh, as on the Myers-Briggs, my I is the giant capital I introvert. And uh, up until 15 or 20 years ago, I had a mortal fear of public speaking to such an extent that even when it's my friends and my gaming group, I get nervous if I was running a role-playing game for more than four or five people at a time. So what happened between that and now is, I mean, obviously there were some life experiences, but there was a point where I recognized what was going on and started doing it and building myself up and doing things like going to my first Gary Con, where I'm sitting at the art table next to a uh, good old diesel. And uh, I'm, I'm selling my little Marvin comics. And just because I'm sitting there at, in the artist area selling comics, people are wanting them autographed and it's flipping me the heck out. I don't even know how to do that. I don't know how to respond to that. And then I remembered, wait a minute, I'm a role player. I play role playing games. I'll just role play the comic book artist signing comic books and it'll be fine. And, you know, spent some years watching the Tim Casks and the Jim Wards and the Bill Webbs and the Matt Finches. Sorry to bother you, embarrass you. And, you know, the Brendan LaSalle's watch how they DM and then just start up in my game. And uh, I mean, to see me run a game today, you'd never know I was an introvert. And you'd never know as a young man, younger man, I had a fear, a fear of even standing up in front of people and talking. And the way I basic, the basic thing, I mean, there were a lot of things, but the main thing that got me through that was D and D and role playing games. That's one of many skills that this uh, hobby taught me how to do—an adult ability. Yeah. Let's talk a second about. Um, Sorry, I got preaching there. No, no, no. Um, let's talk a second about first uh, first person because I think everybody on the chat room um, is definitely saying, you know, first person is the way to go. It's to it's to get people. Um, enough into what's going on that they're saying, I do this um, rather than, uh, you know, Legolas does this or my elf archer does this. Um, any argument that uh, that third person, you know, sometimes for, I think for a beer and pretzels type of game, um, you know, my dwarf does something is, 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 is perfectly fine, but I guess that's just because the goal of a beer and pretzels game is, is, is different than a long form campaign. Uh, I mean, you know, as a DM, it's my job to just run a good game and have a good time myself and, and, and provide the means where everybody else enjoys themselves. So like at con games again, where it's a, it's a, it's a whole crayon box of people sitting at your table you know, might be the shy young kid. Um, 
I, I, I like a big spread of ages and genders and just everything. The more the merrier for me. But play style preferences, like third or first person, you'll get a mix. And as a DM, I just want to roll with whatever keeps the person the most comfortable and helps them have the most fun. Mm -hmm. um, that said, you know, there's no doubt that when everybody's like acting as their character, it's more exciting. Like even in the games you run for us, I mean, uh, Ala Fedorova and her husband, Gabe, you know, I can't, I, I was just shocked and dismayed when I met Gabe in person uh, that he didn't have a Russian accent like his character does. <laughs> Cause that was the only Gabe I knew. Yeah, no, it was, uh, I had the, the the same thing. It was like, what are you, you know, what have you done with Gabe? And then remembering the Russian accent was actually fake. So. You know, and, and Allah's good at it and, and, and good on people who have that ability and can do it. Um, I get a little shaky cause I'm, cause I'm Mr. Strategy and Tactics. So I'm usually up in my head trying to figure out how to ricochet a lightning bolt off of something. One of the, one of the best, uh, uh, games I ever played in, and I was I was actually not the uh, the DM in this one, so I was a player in it, um, and it was back in college days. And uh, every single person other than me was a theater major in in that group, and that was oh my, it was it was uh, it was very different from any other game that I have played in uh, because of uh, just everybody had their thing and they were good at it and uh so that uh, oh actually i guess jim hazelton wasn't a theater major but i think he was doing um some theater or something at the time but uh yeah that, that was that was really really quite something was, was was that one because they all just took it for granted that what they were supposed to be doing uh you know you know was uh being their character and and it, that boy that really leads to something uh so this is really interesting cool. topic because I'm not, I'm now I'm now running it through like as a, as a, even as a player in your game you're running right now I hardly ever do the first person thing but then when I'm running a game as a DM I feel a responsibility to try you know whether I'm good bad or iffy Well whenever you're playing Elijah in our game you always say I do this Oh I I think maybe I mean by first person you know getting into saying the lines in a voice and a because I think it's I think that you know that putting the threshold at first person is actually pretty accurate. I mean that's the that that's the illustrator because some people can't do accents, you know. But if they're thinking in terms of I do this, uh, then they're at that threshold where it's showing the DM skill. It, they don't have to. I I don't think that they would necessarily have to go all the way to, uh, you know. What's start. funny about this is. This is one of the things, doing it as a DM with the NPC voices was uh, really inspired by uh, a Gary Khan years ago, Michael Curtis. We, we, we stayed Sunday, didn't leave till Monday, and Michael Curtis ran a, a one-off the books, Call of Cthulhu. It's the only time I've ever personally played Call of Cthulhu. Jen Brinkman, Bob Brinkman, a bunch of us were there. And we had to interview this little old lady in this haunted house who's up to no, you know, interdimensional no good and michael curtis just put his glasses down the end of his nose and did this creepy little old lady voice and like the hair on my neck actually stood up in real life it uh, was completely spooky i remember one time it was at a, a game in a, a living room where um and i think it must have been the old lady i don't remember i think this was a witch that i was doing but it was trying to get one of the uh, characters to drink some of the tea that she'd poured for them. And for the first two or three times, um, here, if here's the tabletop, when I said, and so she offers you more tea and I pushed an imaginary, you know, saucer with tea toward the character. And it was really funny because after this had happened about four times, um, not really deliberately while he was talking, I did that little motion of pushing the saucer toward him. And he actually pushed the saucer back. <laughs> Because he was so, it's at that point had such an image of this teacup moving back and forth that he actually moved the imaginary teacup back away, like he, he had been doing, uh, you know, every other time, but telling me that he was pushing it back. That was a lot of fun to see how you know into it somebody was. Well, but in a way, it still relates to my my fifth tip: like whatever you want from your players, you do it. You demo it as a DM because uh, as 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 you know, terrible as I am at acting and as limited as my voice is, I was running um, 
a play test of a MCC adventure and they ran into screamers who are just these radioactive zombies who are called screamers because out in the glow desert, they're constantly venting the wind up through their empty rib cages through their fossilized cords. And they sound like this and live there. I just freaking went for it and let out this long wail that wouldn't stop. And it spooked one of my players, Julia Page. She just, she went, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, reel it back in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just want to scare i just want to spook them not actually you know trigger somebody and then uh once again jim stanton has a good point which is um uh that when you've got lots of npcs there's probably less of an uh you, you're probably leading um by example like you've been talking about jim um that you probably only have to do a few of those as opposed to telling yourself i must do absolutely every single one of those and that makes me again think of backing up to um the fact that uh some dm tips are gonna work for one person and may not work so well for another dm because we all have our different styles of what we do and some people and i think the thing is to play to your strengths a lot of the time sure although if, if i mean got, you know yeah i'm just talking because you you invited me on the show too. I'm I hope, not I, criticizing I hope, nope. you. I'm not, I'm, you I'm not saying you. I'm just <laughs> you know, I, I'm not speaking any absolutes, and we're just talking about t you know tips and tools. And okay, well, I got a whole toolkit here, and you know the pliers always work better for me than the ratchet wrench, so I'm going to use that. Fine, you know whatever, whatever you have a good time with. Yep. Um, once again, the uh, yeah playing playing in character. That's that's something that. Um, uh, looking again at the chat room comment from uh, Michael I mean, Bolum. as uh, nice and well-intentioned and you know even keeled as I try to be I mean secretly I'm I'm an evil bastard who just loves you know rah, ha, ha, try yeah. this you know so as long as everybody's having fun and keeps coming back it's one of those okay. things that tends to tends to the DM role the DM chair does tend to draw people with that secret personality I think but you know <laughs> Well, there's a there's a there's there's an interesting psychodynamic here where where the 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 DM presentation should be threatening and evil and you know what do we talk about when we're outside smoking? Oh well, that was a TPK, but it's all pretend. <laughs> Nobody's really in their heart of hearts like you know slaying tables of players for fun. Not yeah, you know, I mean maybe when we were all fourteen or something. But oh yeah, in middle school, absolutely. But yeah, once you once you get over that, it's. Uh... But the pretense of it, the the role playing of it is will can can be uh, a factor in enjoyment of the game. I've been wondering about that. Um, you, you've got to pretend to be adversarial when you're really not, because all you want is everybody to have fun. Or do you? Uh, th this, I think, there may be, and I want to talk to more people about it, there may be a slight generational divide there, certainly out of uh, our generation, you know, um, which in, in my case is like Gen X. Um, I think trash talk is absolutely the way to build the tension uh, when you're with players, the, that's, the little, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. The, the little things like, boy, I don't think you guys are going to make it through this one. You know, uh, I'm, I think I can outsmart you on, you know, here and just, you know, just, just ratcheting it up, you know, um, to where they're like, okay, I can, I can do this. You know, this is a challenge. And, you know, once again, it makes the challenges meaningful. Um, and so that's a, a, a good tactic with the trash talk. I have heard, um, you know, some people who react badly to it because I think they then decide maybe it's a DM trust issue. Maybe they decide, oh, gosh, you know, they take it literally and I can't trust this DM not to be a, a killer DM. But in, again, our generation, all the books that were written, you know, sort of suggested that. So it was it was just part of the thing. Uh, you knew that it was just trash talk. Well, I'm absolutely not talking about it in any real way. And in fact, um I try and be, you know, super perceptive and observant because at conventions you just get random tables. And I, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I often get great groups and great tables, but you just, you can't proceed as though that's a given. So I, you know, if there's, I mean, you just, I do. I trash, I trash talk at convention games all the time. Oh, I'm not talking about trash talk and I'm talking about in real life triggering somebody. Oh, oh, something. oh yeah. No, God, no. Yeah. Or, or, or in the midst of, uh, you know, well-intentioned, playful, trash-talking, 
have somebody take it the wrong way, you know, I absolutely try and just, you know, keep an eye on the table. I mean, yeah. I'm pretty, with enough experience, you get pretty good at it. And the other thing is that I think um, one could almost do two parallel sets of discussions about DM tips because I think there are a whole, there are some differences, I think, between the convention game and the long form home game where you know people that are caused by the fact that at the convention game you've got limited time people care less about their characters they've probably not met the other players they've never worked they've never played with you before and that tends to create a different set of both um well if, you know how, how how they're going to work together and how what you've got to do on your side to make it a fun game that some of the parameters and the advice may even be different Sure. I mean, it, it's it's easier for me to uh, make a list of things I don't want to happen at my table that I just try and stay on guard, stay alert and stay on guard for. You know, um, uh, I love kids at the table, but 12, 13 and up, they're OK by themselves. Younger than that, um, it's better with a parent to, to kind of because I don't want to I don't want to accidentally get over anything. I, and I. I uh, I'm, I always pay attention when I got a quiet kid at the table while everybody else is rollicking and having a great time. You know, here's a 12 year old who's just not saying much. And uh, I think I think I understand why. And so I always take a moment to give them the opportunity to. Yeah. Um, same thing with, you know, any player of any gender who's you know not getting their fair bandwidth in the middle of the con game. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I will, you know, do various things to. Just try and keep everybody participating and everybody getting their chance to have the same amount of fun. And we've got um, somebody, uh, we've got a 21-year-old commenting in the in the chat room. And uh, once again, sort of backing up the, 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 the idea that there are some just social generational gaps in terms of the way people work with each other and what the society that they grew up in. Um, you know, he says, in my experience, players my age are very tuned into how fair the GM is and can easily get upset when the GM talks tough and so uh you know that's that's very interesting that you know again in, in our generation that had nothing whatsoever to do with whether you're going to be fair you were you know trash talk was just trash talk um where uh, and i and i wonder also there was you know there's been over the years and especially it was the move to third edition the idea that they were trying to one of the, the reason for putting a lot of rules on the gm was the assumption that it was going to be in many ways a more head-to-head uh, -head sort of game. Where the this GM... is a whole different show, but yeah. Okay, yeah. So so the DM would have edition certain rules. After edition them. of rules trying to uh, manage the power balance between players and DMs. But for a reason. In different because, directions. You know, there there is a reason for doing that, which is the uh, it creates a different sort of game. It creates a head-to-head -head challenge of wits. And when you are playing a game that's been portrayed that way in the rules as being something that's going to work more as a head to head challenge of wits. And I can see that it would be a little alarming. Maybe I still think it's generational, but I can see where I don't think you can write rules. The... I mean, in, in, in the broadest sense possible, we're talking about are bad players and bad DMS. And I don't think, although many people have tried, uh, I don't think you can write rules to prevent a bad DM from being a bad DM or bad players from being bad players. I'd rather focus on the the constructive portion of, of that discussion, like, you know, what can I responsibly do to run the friendliest, most open table, yeah. recognizing that it's a it's a work in progress. I mean, because I, I, you know, I'm 58 and I can look at some uh, older DMs than me and just go, damn, that's a harsh game he's running you know when we're so, talking about a harsh game here's one of the quotes from the chat room is well to be fair mom i killed you in doug's game that one time <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well this right is good, that's this a, a good this is the estimable... just remember it's a game and we're just trying to have fun but i can i you know i can look at a generation older than me that you're talking about that in my judgment is damn that's harsh but then somebody on the other side of me could 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 look at, at how i run a game and have valid points about that you know and it's on me to Keep an open mind. Uh, this is this is uh, this is from the estimable uh, Chulik clan too. So you know you 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 really never know with them. Um, we've got and also uh, oh, Ske Skeeter's just trying to start a fight now. Balanced encounters. Jim Here's Stanton. your balanced encounter, Skeeter. Jim Jim Stanton <laughs> is uh, 
is also saying that he's got um, 16 year olds, uh, 16 year old playing in a, a group of uh, 16 year olds and that it's um, very much the same way that there's less trash talk. At least I think that's what you're saying, Jim. Um, post, if you're saying that it's the same way in terms of the, of the trash talk, cause that would, it's, it's a real interesting question to me um, because there are two things that have happened with D and D first of them is the changes in edition which create um, little D and D cultures that are simply based on how do you play D and D based on the fact that we've all read the same set of rules and the same set of advice from the rules. And then the second one of course, is the actual real life that they're living in, in which social norms have changed a lot. And I think both of those come in when you're talking about, you know, um, gamers who are separated in, in generations. Um, so, um, yeah, Skeeter, Balanced Encounters. Not, not going to go there. Um, and then uh, Tom Tullis says a TPK is a Balanced Encounter. I forgot Michael Bolan was at the infamous Tin Cast game where Zach Glazer was sitting right next to me. And you don't know, you know what the sound of 15 chairs scooting across the floor at once is until you hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that kid wasn't having Tim's game. And um you know, your mileage may vary. He def he clearly had different expectations than uh, than what he got. Um, and uh, and once again, we're talking about the younger generation, less trash talk, very much a fair GM who can't um, change the rules. And I th I think that you know the in the earlier editions too, it was it was very much about a fair GM. Still, it's it, this is what this is is the question of how one conducts oneself in the social contract of the table. And that um, that the trash talk is is far less acceptable uh, in in the younger group, and that's that's um, that's really um, it's, I've seen that I've I've seen a lot of that. I still do trash talk at, at my conventions, and um, uh, you know, and I, I think that's just part of it is that you know if you're if you're there to play in my game, uh, that happens to be the way that I do it, and hopefully people aren't intimidated by it but uh yeah maybe i'll preface some of the the games with you know i do a lot of trash talk that does not mean i'm out to kill characters it's because i'm trying to increase the the excitement level and uh by reminding you that i that your your characters might absolutely die here so <laughs> i mean i mean you know one and like rocky says every generation hates an unfair dm i, I think that's true Go ahead. You, I interrupt. I, I don't know. I'm just like up in my head thinking three or four different ways, um, things at the same time. You know, you can you can you can be responsible and you can uh, take your responsibilities as a game master seriously uh, within the context of you're running a game. Everybody's just trying to have fun and and do your best. I mean, you know, I'm I'm of the firm conviction that uh, the most egregious among us are still doing the best they got with what they have. Oh yeah, you know nobody. No, no. I I've never met a human being that got up and first thing, you know, cup of coffee and who can I screw up today? You know, it's their mission <laughs> in life. Nobody's a villain in their own eyes. Is that <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you know, and 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 we don't. I mean, I I'm just not one who's given to spending a lot of bandwidth on outlying situations too. I I, mean, I, I do, however, think it's fair to try and encourage the characters to pull the levers. I think that's fair because they should just know better. I mean, I think that's the, I think that's the Jim Ward school of thought. <laughs> I mean, talk about a bastard DM. It took me six years to survive my first Jim Ward con game, but I, I loved every single minute of it. And yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, he just, you know, once again, you're talking about the, uh, uh, the style. I mean, everyone knows that in one of Jim's, uh, adventures that you are walking into the spider's web, and and that has to do once again with the issue of you know the the fairness of the world that um and, and the objective reality of the world and letting and having them feel assured that you are not nerfing it. And then I guess the the stuff we're talking about with the younger generation, where it's like don't do the trash talk, uh, is the opposite of that. You know, instead of saying I'm not going to nerf it, there's sort of the responsibility to suggest that you're not going to make it. Um, an unwinnable situation either you're you're not going to move outside the uh the box and and change things that aren't supposed to be there so that it's not a fair contest that's, that's actually two different 
uh, two different types of guarantees that may be needed in the two. I'm so much more interested in the conversation we're having now than Jim's five DM tricks. Thank you for that. Um, you know, <laughs> it's it's on me to you know be open minded and 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 be aware of my table so that I don't you know I don't I I, I obviously don't think I'm an egregious trash talker um, because I have my games fill up and people and there are people who come back for more the, the following year um but i don't you know i only know what i know and the only two joysticks i have in a whole situation is what i say and what i do you know yep so uh um we are getting some discussion about uh, some more discussion about the younger generation and i did a show where i was talking um with uh ben barsh about um some of this and uh ben is 22 uh you know young 20s anyway and uh, uh has had a show and i think he's migrated over to running the frog god um youtube channel because the one he started working for disney and then he had the issue of hey you know what do i want to focus on is it disney or uh or or D and D? and this gave that gave him a good way of doing one show on D &D yeah, it's without generally agreed brand. he's a cool he's a cool cat yeah and so anyway the um and he and I were talking about that, and um, I think I would. I'm gonna. It would be really interesting to get um, either one person from maybe each decade or something like that of D and D, or uh, do a show um, talking specifically with some people of multiple people of one generation to see how that contrast so maybe maybe that's something that i'll do what i'm the other that would be I'm, a great topic for show because it's it's just like death itself the, the 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 aging process is inevitable and i can see it in my own gaming career where when i was ben's age a rule system could not be crunchy enough for me i live for that stuff i thought eight the first edition ad and d was a rules like game and friggin a shoebox of D6s wasn't enough for me to play champions. You know, I love crunchy, complex rule sets at that age. And here I am, you know, 30 years later, and I'm the dead opposite of that. I want to just rule simple and rules light as I can, yeah. just for one specific example. So I know, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, there are, I think there are several different approaches, um, even to D&D &D about. My uh, play style preferences have all shifted around. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, we have been talking for one hour and four minutes, um, and so that's generally where I try and, and cut it off um, so that we've got the division between the shows, and we definitely have gotten off of uh, the 5DM tips, and we're now talking about uh, generational D&D. &D. So I think give, rather, rather than uh, remain on a sidetrack that is way at the end of the video, uh, let's go ahead and, and, and wrap up. Uh, with the five D uh, the five DM tips that you gave, why don't you give them to us uh, all at once again in in the order you did them? Oh, I just like to run uh, games by always saying yes to the players. I roll my dice out in front of the players. I try to listen to my players all the time, but especially when they're speculating. Um, if a PC has to die, I'm going to make it spectacular so there's a good story and uh, the I I try and model the behaviors I want to encourage my players at the table. Which I think is an awesome list. And I'm, I'm, I am going to get, we're getting a lot of very good feedback uh, in the chat room again about this video, Jim. So um, we are, uh, I'm probably going to do this again with some other people and get their uh, five tips and do a, a similar show so that people. Brother, can... any, anytime you have a last minute cancellation, I'm happy to come on and lower the bar for all future guests. All right. That's great. Because then we can say, you know, look, well, it's easy to be on this show. You know, Jim Wampler has been on the show. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I also think this was a really, really interesting show, Jim, by the way. And um, so say goodbye to all the fans. See ya. And I will say, no matter what kind of Dungeons and Dragons it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it.